Well, amen. And we are we are up and running. Am I right? Amen. Well, it is good to be back. It's good to be back on the air. And for any who have tuned in, we are glad that you can hear our voice. And hopefully we're not too loud. We're going through a different uh, setup this morning. And hope the volume is right. And hope that folks get a blessing from it. Uh, we're excited to broadcast. We're excited because we we generally have listeners. We have numerous listeners across the United States. But we have listeners, I've been told we have listeners in Copenhagen, Denmark. I've been told that we have listeners um, in other places in Europe. I know that we have uh, we have listeners in, uh, in the south of England. Um, I know that we have listeners in... Um, New Zealand, um, just grateful, just grateful for the opportunities God has opened up, and uh, there are others that we don't know about. There are others that we have no idea about. I'm sure we have a we have listeners in Washington D.C. too, probably. Who knows? That's okay. They need to hear about Jesus too. Praise God. Take your Bible, turn to Romans chapter eight, if you would. Romans chapter eight, and. Uh, we're going to look at one verse, and then we're going to talk about it for the next few minutes or so. I want to encourage you this morning. I really want to encourage. I, I, I've i talked about a lot about the chaos of this world and, and primarily the chaos we see here lately, the way everything seems to be coming un, unwound. Um, if things don't change, we, we don't have a lot of time for this thing called freedom in America. It's slipping quickly through the fingers of all those that love freedom and liberty. Our world is changing. It's a very, very um, unstable place. And uh, a lot of changes are going on to bring about what the Bible has told us was going to happen all along. Um, I don't want to sound like a broke record, but hey, <clears throat> You know, we're on the doorstep of, of number one, the Lord's return to this earth. We're on the doorstep of our catching away to be with him. And this world giving itself wholeheartedly to the man of sin, the Antichrist, it's ready for him now. It's absolutely ready for him now. Uh, this world would, would absolutely go bonkers if the Antichrist were to step forward, but that's not God's plan. God's plan is for his people to be called out, and it doesn't make any difference what anybody else thinks about that. That's what the Bible teaches. I know there are people who argue with me, probably people listening uh, on the Internet who would argue with me, but it really doesn't make a difference. You want to argue with me or not, God's right, and, God, and, and if you're not in line with God, you're not right. So, But I'm, I'm excited. I'm thankful that the Lord's coming. I think where a lot of people a lot of people kind of get turned off is when they see uh, Christians who think that Jesus is going to come get us before anything gets rough. Um, there's no guarantee of that. There's no guarantee that we won't suffer in America. There's no guarantee that we won't go through horrible things here. There's no guarantee of that. America's not promised some easy pass. Matter of fact, I say it all the time, but America's had more freedom. America's had more blessing. America's had more. Uh, given to the to them to us from God than just about any other country in the world, and the Bible lets us know that to whom much shall be given, much shall be required, and we've certainly fall, fallen down on God. We've dropped the ball, and uh, and don't think that God didn't see that, and don't think that God is not going to uh, repay us for our deeds in America. So while the Lord is coming, and I'm excited about it, I'm also uh, Fearful for my, not fearful for myself, but fearful for others around me who don't have a mindset that uh, lines up with the Word of God, who seem to think that it's all, it, that the Lord's going to save us from any kind of uh, pain or suffering. But I, I just want you to understand something. To suffer for Christ's sake has always brought his true disciples joy. Because when we suffer, if we suffer for Christ's sake, it brings us closer to him because he suffered for our sake. And not to say, oh, boy, I hope I get to suffer. Boy, I hope I do. You know, None of us are like, man, I hope I have to suffer. But if we do, we should count it joy because it's going to be a, it's going to be a blessing 
in disguise. But anyway, I don't want to harp on that this morning. Uh, I want you to understand that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. And that's what we're going to read this morning. Romans 8, 37, if you'd look there. Romans 8, 37. <clears throat> Matter of fact, we can, we can start there in verse 35 because it's just encouraging reading the whole way through. The Bible says there in verse 35, chapter 8, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You know, the one I'm, I'm so thankful for something. I'm so thankful that he saved me. I'm thankful that he did all the saving. I'm thankful that it's all on him because I can't mess it up. Praise God. I cannot mess up what he has done. So that's why Paul goes on to say all that. He said, I am persuaded none of those things can touch what God has done in me. It can't change my salvation any. Amen? We are more than conquerors. When I think of someone who's a conqueror, all the enemies around them are defeated. There's nobody left. Amen? Nobody, I, 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 picture, a, I picture a man on a battlefield, and all around him there, there are dead bodies of all of his enemies, and, and none of them are still moving. I see. I, I, used, I, like to, I, I used to like to watch swamp people, and they shoot them alligators and put them in the boat. And that, I, you see them traveling across some swamps, and some of them alligators are still moving. That'd make me nervous. Amen. I don't. I don't want nothing that's going to hurt me still moving. Amen. When it's done. But, but you know what? A conqueror. None of his enemies are still moving. They're all gone. Amen. And he stands there victorious over all of it. The the, the danger has passed. And and God says, in our case, it's more than that. Not only is the danger passed. Listen, we have, it's not just that we're safe from, from danger, but we have something much more than that. Amen? It's not just that all that's over. We don't have to worry about that. We have something to look forward to. And I want us to look at that this morning. Amen? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, help us this morning and meet with us, please, Father. I pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit of God would stir inside of me, Lord, that you put your hand upon me and you'd use me for your honor and glory this morning. I want to preach your word, Lord, and, and please you, Lord. I want to, uh, things, the words of my mouth, that, Lord, be acceptable in your sight, Lord, be pleasing to your ears. And Father, I pray the Holy Ghost of God would take my words and use them this morning, Lord, as I use your word. And Father, I pray, Lord, you'd give us ears to hear, you'd speak to our hearts, Lord, you'd change us. Father, you'd fashion us into the image of Christ. And Lord God, I pray that we'd be pleasing in your sight. Lord, that we would be useful to you. Lord, be profitable to you. Lord, as we live out the remainder of our days, Father, we just give you glory. Lord, I just pray you'd open our eyes and help us to see who we are in you, see who you've made us, and see what you can do with us. Lord, encourage us. Make us excited to do more than we've ever done. Lord, make us hungry to, to reach out, Lord, to you and ask you, Father, to, to fill all the empty voids in our life. Lord, to make us uh, feel like we belong, Lord, because we do. We belong in your family. We belong amongst your, your children. And, Lord God, I pray that you'd, you'd encourage us. Lord, you'd strengthen us. You'd make our, our, our hands fit, Lord, to battle against the enemy. Lord God, that you'd give us a mouth to speak truth and a mind to think right things. Lord God, please, touch us, speak to us this morning. For Christ's sake, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. By way of introduction, I, I want to tell you there's three things that we need to know this morning. There's three things that we need to grasp and we need to understand. Number one, we need to believe that we are the person that God says we are. Listen, I, I, I tell you, there's, there's a lot of people 
in, in my world who've said a lot of ugly things about me. And, and that ain't no surprise to nobody. I, I mean, I've been called everything in the world. I've been, I've been called a cult leader. I've been called a manipulator, a control freak. I've been called all kinds of horrible things. And I mean, I, I've been called things I'm not even going to go on beyond that. I mean, ain't, ain't no point in saying it out loud, but I've been called some pretty uh, rotten things. And it wasn't because I was ugly to anybody. It was because I stood my ground. It was because I wouldn't, I wasn't going to budge on things I believed in. And folks, it doesn't matter what others think. I've tried to get that through to people's heads all, all these years. We live in a world where people are concerned about so much about what others think of them. The Bible tells us that when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. They may not like you, but they're at peace with you. And folks, I, I, it really doesn't make any difference. As long as, God, as long as God knows that you're seeking to please him, as long as, long as, you're, as you're standing for truth, you're standing for right, you're encouraged to live for him, it really doesn't make any difference what everybody else around you thinks. God tells us in his word that if a man come after me and hate not his father and mother and his brethren and his sisters and, and, his, and his wife and yeah, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If we put others ahead of Christ, we can't follow Christ. Amen? That's pretty simple because if you're following them, you can't follow both at the same time. So we need to we need to understand it doesn't matter what other people think about us. And guess what? It really doesn't even make a difference what you think about you. What really matters is what God thinks about you. You need to understand that who God says you are is truly who you are. The devil will lie to you and, and fill your head full of notions about who you are. The devil reminds you all the time of your downfalls. He reminds you all the time of your shortcomings. He wants to make you feel as low as he possibly can. Because if he gets you down that low, you're not going to do much for God. And that's not to say we shouldn't be humble. We ought to humble ourselves, not let the devil do that work for us. Amen? When we humble ourselves before God, then, then God is able to take and lift us up. When the devil gets us down there, he just wants to kick us around, and we don't feel like we can do anything for God. So number one, we must believe that we're the person that God says we are. Number two, we must believe that we are where God says we are. Amen? You say, what do you mean by that? I'm talking about secure in the beloved. We need to understand that we are secure in Christ. We need to understand that, that we are in Christ. We are in his family. We have a place in his throne room. Amen? We need, we need to understand that, that, that God has made us different than we were before. We need to understand, number three, we must believe that we can do what God says we can do. If we truly believe God, listen to me, if we truly take God at his word and we truly respond in the way that we ought to, we'll please God. It's not complicated. You know, the Christian life is not rocket scientists. It's just trust. It's just trust. This is downright trust the whole way. That's what it is. Number one, this, this morning, you hang with me. And again, those who, are, those who are listening this morning have no idea how tired and groggy I am. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask their, them for prayer as well, ask you for for prayer as, as I preach this morning that God will use me and that nothing will hinder the message. So number one, we must believe that we are the person that God says we are. Now, who does God say we are? Well, I'm not what I was. Amen. I'm different than I was. God tells me that I am created in righteousness. God created me in righteousness. In other words, when God sees me, God does not see me independent of Jesus. God sees me in Christ. If God saw me independent of Jesus, then I would still be an enemy of God. But see, I, my life is hid in Christ. Amen? The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, For he, God the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made Jesus to take my sin for me. God, God, God put him here to load up all of my horrible filth and all my horrible wickedness and put it all upon him. Amen. He took it. He got all of our sin, every one of us, even those, even those of us 
uh, even those among us who want nothing to do with him, he took the sin of the entire world. It just blows my mind when I think about that. I think about how filthy I am. I think about how, how rotten I am. I think about what a louse I am. I think about how I failed. I think about how disgusting I've been. And I think, good night. He did that for me, and not only me, but he did it for everybody. Good night. What a horrible experience the cross would have, what, what, was. And I can't even imagine that, to have had to suffer for every bit of that and have an understanding, the realization, the conscious realization of the weight of all that sin upon him. And yet he did that willingly in love because he wanted us to be with him. That's just, it's beyond my comprehension, but it causes my heart to flood with love for my Savior when I realize what, what kind of love he had for me. Amen? He knew no sin. Jesus, I can't imagine when Jesus had to experience that sin upon him. I cannot even begin to fathom that. But yet he did it. He made him to be our scapegoat. He made him to be our sacrifice. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Don't you miss that. You better wake up, son that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. See, you need to understand that God says you are righteous. The devil will tell you that you're no good. The devil will tell you that God doesn't want you. The, the devil will tell you, you failed God too many times. You done blown it. God's sick of you. He's tired of you. How many times are you going to do the same thing and come back to him and ask for forgiveness? How many times? I mean, good night. How do you even have the guts to walk into his throne room and say, I'm sorry, after all the times you've blown it? Same old way. Over and over and over. Blah, blah, blah. He goes on forever. And he won't shut up. Anybody else ever experienced that? Anybody ever feel like that? Here I come again. Same old, same old. How did I trip the same way again? I knew the, I knew the snare was there. How did I trip again? Yep, it happens over and over. Maybe that's the reason why the Bible says, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. We fall down the same way over and over. God made us frail little pathetic creatures. The righteousness of God. Why? Because it's not mine. It's nothing I've ever done. It's that Christ's righteousness have been imputed or placed on me. Just like my sin was placed on Jesus, Jesus' righteousness was placed on me. What a trade I got. Amen. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 1.30, the Bible says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That's who he is to us. Uh, I don't know anything. I'm, I'm a dummy without God. I can tell you right now, I, I, I wonder I can even tie my own shoes without God. He is my wisdom. What truth I understand, it came from God. Amen. What I understand about right in this world, it came from God. It didn't come from TV. It didn't come from the news media. It didn't come from other people's opinions. It came from God. And that's why so, it's so hard to live as a Christian in this world because most people don't get their truth and their opinion from God. They get it from others and they get it from what they're told. And so when you stand for God and when you stand for truth and right, people are not, a lot, a lot of times people are going to look at you like you're nuts because it doesn't jive with what they're saying. It doesn't jive with what they think. Folks, listen, it doesn't matter if the whole world's against you. Amen? I can't remember what preacher of the past. It was either Spurgeon or Moody or one of them. And someone said to them, said, I think it was Mr. I think it was Spurgeon. Said, Mr. Spurgeon, the whole world's against you. He said, well, then I'm against the whole world. Amen? I'd rather be a whole, against the whole world and, and be for God and God for me than to, than, to, and the, than to have the whole world love me. Amen? See, God is my wisdom. God is my righteousness. God is, God is my sanctification. He's my holiness. Amen. He is my redemption. He's my, he is my ticket into heaven. Ain't nothing else going to get me there. He is the price. Ephesians 4.24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I don't have to be the way I once was. Amen. I am new in Christ Jesus. Amen. Listen. Not only am I created in righteousness, but he has made me fit. I didn't fit. He made me fit. Colossians 1.24, the Bible says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet 
to be partakers. That's M-E-E-T. He hath made us meet or made us acceptable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Listen, when you and I stroll through the gates of heaven, when you and I walk in and we see the gates of pearl and we see the walls of jasper and all the different kinds of colors and, uh, of the stones that they're made of, when we see the host of heaven in the robes of white singing and praising God and falling down before the throne and we see the creatures that worship God before His throne and we see the lightnings and thunderings and everything else around the throne of God and we, we realize then in that moment what holiness we've entered into. When we finally have a conscious realization of what we are in Christ Jesus, it's going to blow our ever-loving minds, I'm telling you. We have no idea down here because we can't see past this shell of flesh. But once we see Him face to face, there will be, it will be an absolute mind-blowing experience that will never end. Hallelujah. I mean, listen, we all be excited about what we are in Jesus. He made us acceptable. There ain't no way I could measure up. There is no way you and I could enter into that congregation and feel like we fit there. Amen? I mean, I've never done anything that was worthy of holiness. Praise God. It's all been Jesus in me. It ain't been me. Nothing I did was worthy of that. But He did it all. Praise God. He made us fit. Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know these verses very well. But it says, and we know. And it means we don't hope or think, but we know that all things work together for good. Our whole life has been planned out, whether we realize it or not. God has plotted and planned our life out. He's done it for His purpose. Amen. All things work together for them who, that love God. And I love Him. I'm thankful that He loves me. I'm thankful that He cares for me. I'm thankful that He has a plan for me. To them that are called according to His purpose. You know, most people don't want to do it God's way. But God doesn't want it done sort of His way. God wants it done His way. I can relate to that. I'm a boss. I have employees. I want things done my way. Everybody has their own way of doing something. I want it done my way. And maybe your way works for you, but you know what? It's my way because it's my place. Amen? And this is God's place. This is His world. And God has a certain way He wants things done. He doesn't want us to change things to fit the culture. God doesn't want us to try uh, things that, that, are, that go against His Word in order to bring people in to hear His Word. God wants it done to be honoring and, and, and pleasing to Him. The Bible says it's according to His purpose. For whom He did know, I like this, He also did predestinate. What are you saying that for? Why are you emphasizing that? Well, I just said He made us fit. We are the person He said we are. He has made us fit. He has made us acceptable. The Bible says, whom He did foreknow. God knew me before I was saved. God knew who I was. God created me. God knew all about me. And not only did God know me before I was saved and know all about me, but God knew when I was going to get saved. God knew not only when I was going to get saved, but God knew when I was going to fall down after I got God knew everything. God still knows it all. He'll know it all forever. God knows every little last speck and detail of my life. And because of that, God made every step of my life lead me in, a, in the right direction for His plan. That's, that's what that means. He did predestinate. We, we, we live in a world and we think it's full of coincidence and chance. It's not. God is working at all that. Everything is lining up. They're falling like levers in a machine. This whole world, everything, the Bible is coming true before our eyes, and we all know it. It's just not some random thing we're living in. We have a sovereign God who knows exactly what He's doing. And He has, he has made you and me feeble creatures. You and me who can't hardly figure out how to come in out of the rain. He has made us fit for His use. He's made us fit. I, I like this, to be conformed to the image of His Son. You pour water in something, stick it in the freezer, it'll conform. Amen? God wants us to conform. He wants us to, when He's finished with us, He wants us to look like His Son. Not just, he, what He wants is he, want us, he wants us to have the love of Christ. He wants us to speak the words of Christ. He wants us to have the temperament of Christ. 
He wants us to have the compassion of Christ. He wants us to have the love for Him that Christ had for His Father while He was walking on this earth. That's what God wants from us. Amen? He says that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, if, we're, if, if, if we understand and we believe that God made us who, we, who He wants us to be, if we understand that we are created in righteousness and Jesus did all that for us to make us acceptable, if we realize that, that God has prepared every step of the way to bring us to this point and He has a plan for us, His plan is that other people around us end up coming to Christ because of us. That's what He means. He, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. That I got born again, and now because I got born again, and because I'm being conformed to Christ, God is using me to lead others to Christ. God is using me to be an influence in others' lives. God is using you. And you may not even realize that God has got you in a position with some people that need Jesus. You may not even be aware of it. But God's aware of it. And the more we put our eyes on Him and the more we realize that, that it's not us. See, a lot of people don't witness. A lot of people don't do much for God. And why is that? Punch you. Why is that? It's because we don't think we're good enough. We don't think we know how to talk good enough. We don't think we know enough Bible. I think the worst thing people are afraid of, they're afraid they're going to end up talking to some Mormon or something. And they go, I don't know nothing about no Mormons. I try, I try to witness to a Mormon, I'd be lost a goose. They'd have me so confused. And so we, or, or boy, if I start talking to somebody, and what if they know, what if they know more Bible than I do? That's the devil's excuses. That's all that is. If God be for us, who can be against us? God wouldn't call you to do something he's not going to go with you on. Amen? The Bible says they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. God makes us fit. God prepares us. God makes us conquerors, more than conquerors. We're to believe we're the person that God says we are. Listen, he's our author and he's our finisher. He's the one that set us out on this journey and he's the one that will carry us through. Amen? Let me say to you, number two, not only should we believe that we're the person that God says we are if we're going to be more than conquerors, but we need to understand we're new. We're new. God didn't make us over. We're not a retread. I don't know if all you, everybody here knows what a retread is, but God, God didn't. Sometimes they put they put 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 rubber on an old tire, and they don't last long. It comes flying off on the highway. God didn't make us a retread. God made us brand new. The Bible tells us that, that we're new creatures. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, again, we're created in righteousness. We're in Christ. It, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm not, I'm not even the same as I was. I'm not, I'm not anything like I was before. And you're not either if you're saved. There's nothing about you except for the way you look in the mirror that's the same. You're totally changed, totally different. Amen? You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, preacher. You just said a while ago we fall down a lot and things beset us. <clears throat> Absolutely. Before you were new, look up here. Before you were new, you were a what's called a dichotomy. You were two parts. You were body and soul. Your body being the part that other people see, your soul being the part of you that other people relate to and talk to and know. But you had no third part. You had no part of you that talked to God. You had no part of you that communicated with Him. You had no part of you that was going to live forever with God. But when, when you came to Christ and you believed upon Him and His shed blood to wash your sins away, God brought your spirit to life. He quickened the Holy Spirit of God quickened or made alive your spirit within you. And that's the part of you that communicates with God. That's the part of you that understands Scripture. That's the part of you that God is able to flow through to others. Old things are passed away. What is that? Well, passed away means they're dead. See, all of us come to this world, and we're all talked we all, we're all talked to about what we're going to be when we grow up. Started off in kindergarten. 
What are you going to be when you grow up, little girl? What are you going to be, little boy? What do you want to be? And, oh, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be the president. I want to do this. Uh, listen, like a five-year-old has any clue what they're going to do. And we're asked that all through our life, like we know. Folks, it's his plan. He predestinated. It's not us. We're to look to him. We're to seek him. How many people, listen, how many people anymore go to God and say, Lord, who am I to marry? Lord, I want you to make sure I marry the right woman. I want to make sure I marry the right man. I don't want to be with the wrong one. I don't want you to go out there and find somebody who seems to like me that's pretty or handsome and, and just get involved and just jump in and I'm going to make a life. That don't work. If God's not in it, it will not work. Amen? If God's not in it, it will be a struggle and a battle for, from day one and it will always be that way. Listen, God, God has a plan. God has made us new. We are to honor him with every part of our life, not just on Sunday. We're to honor him every day. We're brand new in Christ Jesus. The old life is dead. The old plans, the old dreams are dead. We ain't never going to go back to what we once were. And if we do, we'll be the absolutely most miserable person in the world trying to live an old life that is dead. Amen? There's nothing, there's nothing more sad in this world to me than to see an old woman trying to dress like a teenager. I used to work at Walmart years ago, and I don't know her name, and I wouldn't call her name if I knew her name. But there was a woman who used to come out there, and I mean, she was, she was in her 70s, and she would wear short shorts and tank tops and wore her hair like a young girl and all made, made lots of makeup, and, and uh, she would press around there and try to, oh, she'd try to be so young and act so young. And it looked disgusting. Because that's long gone. Can't go back there. Amen. I mean, you don't want to see some, some fella in his 80s suit up in, a, in football gear and get out on the football field just because he ran a football back when, his, when he was 20. Listen, you can't go back there. Once it's over, it's over. And once we come to Christ, it's over. We can't go back there and live that life we lived before. All things have become new. Galatians 6.15, the Bible says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. What is God saying there? Religion ain't got nothing to do with being a new creature. Man's restrictions and man's ideas of what, of what a believer is supposed to be, it makes no difference what man puts on us. What matters is that God says, listen, the old you can't clean up the old you. You can't change the old you. It's a new creature inside of you, a spirit that was not there before. Listen, not only are we a new creature, but there's no condemnation. I, I like the fact that God wiped the slate completely clean. See, the devil's just a rotten liar. And he's going to always bring up stuff. He's going to always remind you of your past. He's always going to bring up the things you where you failed. And he's going to make you feel like a loser. He'll do it all the time. But we need to listen to who God, what God says about us. God says in Romans 8, 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We don't all walk after the flesh. The flesh is dead. The flesh is gone. It's dead. It ain't going to do anything. It's never going to amount to anything. It'll never please God, and it'll never help us. It's dead. And so because it's dead, God says we, we walk after the Spirit. We walk in His presence. We walk in His world. We walk as a child of God. And because of that, there is nothing that God can look down and say, see about us and say, uh-huh, there, that right there, that'll keep you out of heaven. You know Rick Warren? Y'all know who Rick Warren is, don't you? Pastor Saddleback, she wrote Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Church. He wrote a bunch of bestsellers. He came out and said this week, or it was reported this week, that he said that if you don't tithe, you may not make it to heaven. You know what? He's an idiot. He's, you, you could go an entire lifetime and not tithe and still go to heaven. Now, by the way, I don't even believe in a tithe anyway. I believe the New Testament giver is a whole different thing than an Old Testament giver anyway. I, I believe the Lord, the Lord wants us to give out the abundance of our heart. But he doesn't require a tithe. He doesn't require a tenth in the New Testament era. As a matter of fact, I think it probably ought to be more than a tenth, but that's just that that's neither here nor there. But God can't look down and find something about you and me 
that will send us to hell. He can't because it's not there. And the reason it's not there is because Jesus' blood has washed it away. The reason it's not there is because it's gone, because he's removed our sins from him as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says he's, he's thrown it behind his back. He'll remember, he's forgotten it. He'll remember it no more. John 3.18 tells us that he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth is, I'm sorry, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John, John 3, 8 whittles the world down to two different kinds of people, and that's it. The one who believes on him and the one who does not believe on him. Let's, listen, and don't mistake this. There's lots of different kind. I mean, there's lots of people who believe in him but don't believe on him. There's lots of people who say, oh, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. The devils believe too, and they tremble. There's lots of people who say they believe in Jesus and they don't tremble at all. Listen, I thank God. I thank God that I have not just believed that he exists, but I believe that he is able to do what he said he'd do. I believe that he's able to save me completely. I believe there's nothing about, about me that he could not wash away. I believe his blood is completely effectual. There, it had absolute saving power and wiped all my sins away, canceled them all out. Amen? The Bible says, but he that believeth not is condemned already. It's not that he may end up going to hell. He's already hell bound because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, the only sacrifice that would do. He's not put his faith in that sacrifice. Amen. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And get this shall not come into condemnation. In other words, not only am I not condemned now, but guess what? There ain't nothing down the road that can condemn me because I am not what I once was. I can't go back to being what I once was. I can't change that. You can't change that about me. The devil can't change that about me. God himself won't change that about me. He's told me there's no way once I'm saved, once I'm secure in Jesus, there's no way to undo what he's done. I don't care what any preacher says. It really makes no difference if it don't line up with the Word of God. There's plenty of preachers who will tell you different, but they're liars and they're, and they're deceivers if they believe anything other than eternal security because Jesus Christ has said so. And He is the way, the truth, the life, and ain't nobody going to the Father but by Him. Amen? Praise God. We've passed from death unto life. Listen, we're not new. We're made. I mean, we're, we're we're new. We're not made over. I almost said that backwards. Ephesians one six Bible says, "To the praise of His glory." I'm sorry. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Amen. There ain't nobody going to get to heaven, and God's going to say, "Oh well, we don't want you." Everybody else come in, but you're not coming. No. If you came through the blood, we're going to all be welcomed. Amen. It won't be, there won't be classes of believers in heaven either. Amen? There's one ticket, and it puts everybody on equal footing. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Number three, let me say to you this morning that we're more than conquerors because he, Jesus Christ, has qualified us. The Bible tells us, again, that he's redeemed us. Hebrews 9, 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. That was the price. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. When he rose from that grave, he went to heaven. He went into God's throne room where the Holy of Holies is in heaven, where, the, where, the, where the, the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven, amen, where the real Ark is. And he went in there to the mercy seat in that, above the Ark of the Covenant, and he there took hyssop with his own blood and sprinkled it as our high priest upon the mercy seat for you and me. And once it was made, it was made once and for all and forever, and there's nothing, anything, or anyone can do in this world to change what Jesus has done. 
He obtained that salvation for us, and He made it so. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed, hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law, listen, I, nobody in here can keep it. There ain't nobody, and there's so many people in this area, in this all of this nation who are, who are reverting back to Judaism, reverting, re reverting back to the Mosaic law and trying to live under it. And you cannot do so. You cannot trade Jesus for Moses. It will not work. Moses will lead you straight to hell. Jesus is the only way. Galatians 3.13, the Bible says, I just read that. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. We, praise God, we, we, we're not under that curse because he became the curse. The Bible says everyone's a curse that hangs on a tree, amen? God, God made him. He, think about that, what he did for us. He became an accursed thing for us. It just, it just blows my mind, the depth of the Lord's love for us. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Listen, thank God. Listen, I'm not going to hell, but not only that, look up here. I'm not going to suffer through a tribulation period either. He has saved us from the wrath to come. Praise God. I may, hey, listen, I may lose my head. I, my blood may spill out on the ground for Christ's sake. I don't know what the future holds for me. But I can tell you this. I will not have to live through those seven years of Jacob's trouble upon this earth. I will not because the Lord has saved you and I from the wrath that's to come upon this world. He's not going to make us go through that. We're the bride of Christ. I mean, what kind of groom takes his wife and puts her through hell for seven years before he marries her? No. God's not going to do that to us. God is going to take his people out. Colossians 1, 12 through 14, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet. He's made us acceptable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He made us, he made us fit. He's made us qualified. Nothing about me is any good. And Jesus made it all okay. He made it all acceptable. He made it all where we can fit. He made us where God looks at us and God doesn't see our wicked hearts. He doesn't see our filthiness. He don't see the, 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 the corruption that's in us. It's all been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and God the Father does not see it. Hallelujah. In whom we have redemption through His blood. We're forgiven, praise God. God, Christ qualified us. Again, He made us, He made us acceptable. Amen. And not only has he, had he has He qualified us to stand in God's presence, not only has He qualified us to, to someday be around the throne of God, to live forever in God's heaven, but He keeps on keeping us qualified as we live this life. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. The Bible says, But this man, because he continueth forever, he continueth ever, he lives forever, he hath an unchangeable priesthood, whereby he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Don't you like that right there? But what if I, but what if I mess up like this? Well, he's able to cover that too. Oh, but what if I go further? Well, he's able to cover that too. He saves to the uttermost. Well, what if somebody like what if somebody like Charles Manson repented and wanted to get saved? He's able to cover that too. He's able to cover. Hey, listen. He's able to save Barack Hussein Obama if he'd come to him in repentance and faith. He's a, he's able to save anybody in Guantanamo Bay this morning if he turned from his wickedness and he turned from his false religion and he came to Jesus Christ and believed upon him for salvation, he's able to save any of them. Sad truth of it is, they're probably not going to. But the truth of it is, he can and he, and he could and he would. He's able to save to the uttermost. 
that come to him, unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. See, no matter what, see, the devil comes to me and you. The devil comes to us, and the devil sits on our shoulder, and he says, oh, no, you've, again, you've done blown it too many times. God's tired of you. You're no good. He tells us that again and again. But even though he doesn't quit, Jesus doesn't quit either. Because every time, listen, every time the devil comes to you and he tells you you're no good and you don't measure up, Jesus says to the Father, I don't know exactly how, what he says, but he shows them hands and feet. But I paid the price. So it doesn't matter what this devil says. Not as though God would be swayed by the devil to begin with. I want to I'll make that clear. Not as though God's kind of wishy-washy on which way he's going to go. The devil doesn't have a chance. Amen? Because my, my, my propitiation, my paraclete, my intercessor is there constantly at the hand, right hand of God to ensure that nothing is going to pass before God that puts me in anything but a child of God relationship. Nothing can change that. I don't care what anybody in any other denomination has to say about it. it. It really is irrelevant. Jesus keeps me. Amen. Romans 8, 34, the Bible says, Who is he that condemneth? Who in the world is going to make me lost again? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Not just died, but is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Can't nobody condemn us. So lastly, let me, let me get to this point. Let's be strong in the grace of Christ. Let's be strong. We don't have to, You said, well, the world around us is so hard to live in. The world around us comes against us so often. Yes, I know. But the God of heaven is for us. The God of heaven made this world. The God of heaven has told us what was going to happen in this world. The God of heaven has told us that though we be in a world full of enemies and though we be a sheep accounted for the slaughter, we are more than conquerors. We're ambassadors for Christ. He's told us that. And he's told us that no matter what comes our way, he's on our side. He's with us. He is not going to allow our foot to slide. He gives us sweet peace and sweet sleep. Amen, I need some this morning, amen, but praise God. I'm thankful that God is able to take care of us, praise God. And that nothing that changes in this world can change that. 2 Timothy 2, 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want you to hear these four thoughts when we go to the house. You see, the grace of Christ the blood of Christ deals with sins and guilt. My sins are gone because Jesus' blood washed them away. The guilt of sin is gone because the sins are gone. Though I look back and I, it, 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 I look back and I see what I was. So many people look back on their life before they came to Christ and they say what a horrible mess they made of things. But you see, that's all been forgiven. It's all gone. The guilt of it. it you know, it makes no difference what you did before. Murderers have been forgiven. Uh, abusers, rapists, people with the filthiest of the filthy in the flesh have been forgiven if they've come to Christ because they're not what they once were. He bore our guilt. You see, there's a reason why uh, there's a reason why he hung there naked. We don't see that and think about that. I mean, it's, they don't paint pictures like that. They, and, and they shouldn't. But the Bible makes it plain. that I mean, he had no garment on. They hung him naked on that cross. Why did he bear the shame? He bore the shame for me so that I don't have to carry shame. He carried it all to the cross for me. The cross of Christ 
So the blood deals with sins and guilt. The cross of Christ deals with the sinner and the sins of the flesh. Again, while he hung there on the cross, they mocked him. They spit at him. They jeered at him. They said, you know, he saved others. He can't save himself. If you're the Christ, come down from there. They mocked him. He, he, he did all that for us, amen? He bore our shame on that cross so that we don't have to bear our shame. That's who my Savior is. He, he didn't want me to carry it. He didn't mean for me to carry it. He don't want me walking around with my head down. He don't want me walking around feeling hopeless and useless. He didn't mean for me to walk like that. He said, that's not who you are, Brandon. You're more than a conqueror through me because I did for you what you could not do. I stepped in and I took your place. And not only did I take your place, I have given you the power and built you up to be something you never could have been before. You never could dream of being before. But I made it possible. The life of Christ, His life made available the life of Christ made available to indwell and, re and recreate and empower man because of him, because of his life. His life is in me. His life is in you. He put his spirit within us. He lives in us. He makes us into what we are to be. We can't do it. We're not making ourselves. We're simply following the rules. We're following the path, and he's the power behind it all. Amen? The fullness of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if we need to get close to Jesus. We need to keep our eyes on Him. Again, like I started off this morning talking about Peter walking on the water. He did that in the power of God. He didn't do that in Peter's power. Peter didn't have a water walking power. It was all in the power of God. And you and I, if we're to walk above the circumstances of life, if we're to walk above the trials of life, if we're to walk above the fear and the guilt and the shame, it has to be in God's power. And you can't have God's power if you don't know God's Word and if you don't walk in God's Word and if you don't stay in a prayer life that's effective. Amen. If you don't trust God for His power to do the things that He's commanded you to do, you will never understand what I'm talking about. But boy, if you just latch on and say, I want all that God has for me, you'll find that you can walk on stuff you never thought you could walk on on before. He'll give you power you never dreamed you'd ha that you'd have before, but it'll be power to please him. And lastly, the working of death in man. And when I say the working of death, I mean we're putting, we're putting to death all of the things about us that want to go contrary to God's will. We die to self. Paul said, I die daily. He said, I, I, I keep my body under. Amen? I, 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 I I have to keep myself under and out of the way so that Christ leads, so that Christ is number one in everything that I do. The working of death in man will bring forth indwelling life of Christ. What are you saying? I'm saying this. As long as I'm fighting against God, I can't be successful. <clears throat> you know, I think about when Gideon... When God told Gideon to get the men together and go fight against the Midianites. And he told him, he said, you know, you, you find out who all wants to go home. And whoever wants to go home, you send them home. You know why God did that? Because when a man's heart is somewhere else, he cannot do. He cannot be effective. You can't go to battle worrying about what's going on in the house. And you see, in order for a man to go out on a battlefield and fight, he has to divorce himself and his mind from what's going on behind him. The only thing he can focus on is what's right in front of him. And you and I have got to learn to do that. All the past, all the failures, all the things that have led up to this point mean nothing. That's all behind us. And we have to die to that and say, you know what? All that matters truly is right now with God. And I want all of him I can have. I want, to, I want to please him like I've never pleased him before. I want to be closer to him than I've ever been close to him before. I want to be right directly in the middle of his will. I want his hand upon me, and I want, I want to know that, that my life is pleasing to him. I want his favor. I want his blessings. I want the promises of his word to ring true time after time after time in my life. My friends, if we'll do that, We'll know what it means to be more than a conqueror.
I can honestly say that God has carried me through things I would have never dreamed I could make it through before. I have been in some dark places. I've been in some things that I didn't think I was going to come out of. But God never failed. And God, who's promised me things, has always came through on his promises. He's never changed. And I urge you this morning, I mean, I don't know what I don't know what you're going through in your life. But if you're discouraged, I urge you to get to get your eyes on Jesus and be encouraged. If you feel defeated, realize, hey, you may not have won this round, but there's another one coming up, and God is there. That's a great thing about life, you know? It's just like a boxing match. You might not win every round, but you can win fight. Don't worry about what you did before. Right now is what you need to be concerned about. Let's be let's let God prove himself. If we'll trust him, he'll prove himself to us, and we'll see that God doesn't ever fail. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, thank you this morning. Thank you for the message. I'm so glad, Lord, that you are not not ever going to give up on us. I'm thankful, Lord, that, that Father, that, that you have a plan for each of us. And Lord, that if we'll if we'll put our eyes upon Christ. If we'll believe your word, you'll bring it all to pass. And Lord God, we'll be able to give you more glory than we ever dreamed of around your throne. Lord God, if we'll just bring ourselves before you and ask you, Lord, to use us, you will. Lord, please be with each one. Meet our needs, Father. Encourage us and strengthen us according to your word. Lord, bless the invitation time. Lord, may people bring their needs and requests before you. Lord, I pray, Father, that you'll do business with our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. Little is much when God is in. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and He'll not forget His own. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil or care? You can still be in the battle, in the same. Great place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, He will say to all the faithful, Welcome home, my child, well done. Little